Since early in the war, the battle lines in eastern North Carolina had been shifting as Union and Confederate forces grappled for control of the coast. Its war-weary population was home to divided loyalties. In occupying New Bern, federal forces controlled much of the local economy. North Carolina had a significant number of Unionists, and locals that served in the Confederate Army were often sent to fight far away from home. So men who weren't particularly strong loyalists could be enticed to don a Union uniform. So many of the men who were conscripted into the Confederate Army were lured away by a deliberate plan by Lincoln's War Cabinet. And the plan was something like this, that it was better to get these men out of the Confederate Army than have to fight them. And it didn't matter what shape they were in. There were complaints that many of them were old, infirm, physically disabled. They didn't care. The idea was it was just cheaper to buy them off, get them into the Union lines, uh, give them garrison duty, what have you. And so a number of these men were recruited into the United States Army and promised a couple of things. One, they would get a $300 bonus for enlisting. Two, they'd be used only on garrison duty in local forts and would never really have to go into battle, certainly never be sent to the battlefields of Virginia. And this seemed like a pretty good deal. This is the cold weather, the crops are done for the year, the fishing is done for the year. And what they don't figure on is that North Carolina is about to be invaded by a Confederate army. General George Pickett's campaign in eastern North Carolina came after his division had been destroyed at Gettysburg in July 1863. Even before he failed to retake New Bern, he had become broken and bitter. Desertion was a significant problem for the Confederacy, particularly among North Carolina troops. Local men were being drawn to Union service. Still smarting from his most recent failure, Pickett was eager to make an example of deserters. So at this point in the war, uh, punishment for desertion has gotten uh, far more and more draconian. In the early part of the war, uh, you were welcomed back into unit if you returned. Uh, often you might be flogged, given some other punishment. Then it became branding, and then it became, no, we have to exceed some of you to make sure the other ones stick. And so that is the, the rationale that, um, that Pickett has in his mind. During the recent fight at New Bern, Confederates took a federal blockhouse manned by men of Company F of the 2nd North Carolina Union Volunteer Regiment. The Tar Heel soldiers had been urging their commanding officer to withdraw to safety, but their pleas were ignored. Fifty-three prisoners from the regiment were taken back to Kinston. Of the 53 men, they identified 22 as deserters, but it turns out that's not actually true. Most of them were not deserters. Most of them had served in either Home Guard or Railroad Guard units, which were North Carolina units not subject to the discipline of the Confederate Army. And several others, in fact, probably had been in conscription camps but left before taking the oath of, of allegiance, and therefore under the rules of war, codified, by the way, in 1863 by a guy named Francis Lieber and issued as Lincoln's General Orders Number 100, 156 articles governing the conduct of war and the treatment of prisoners of war. Uh, these guys were entitled to be treated without any kind of retribution at all, but in fact they weren't. All were put on trial. One of the guys that helps them betray each other is Reverend John Paris, who is a quote-unquote chaplain uh, and who, after these men are hanged, actually preaches uh, uh, about the betrayal of Judas Iscariot of Jesus as if he had not himself simply done that very same thing in turning these men against each other and finding men who are implicated in turning them in for, for punishment. Uh, and so 22 men are hanged in four batches, two, five, thirteen, and two more. And this is meant to discipline the ranks that are left. The men are made to stand in a square around the scaffold and watch this time after time in cold, biting, grainy weather. And it has the opposite effect. Indeed, it leads to a, a, ra a rash of people deserting. I think the first hangings led to two dozen desertions, and then it continued. The men got more and more outraged, more and more dispirited, more and more disgusted, as were the, the citizens of Kinston that witnessed it. And the treatment of the men after they were hanged was even, if anything, worse. Um, when they were cut down, the hangman was allowed to strip their clothing. Other people cut their buttons off for souvenirs. Some were buried right at the foot of the scaffold. One man was said to be naked except for his socks. And the families, in many cases, were just too intimidated to come and reclaim the bodies of their loved ones. So the whole episode from start to finish had an air of calculated vengeance and depravity about it. 
Among those hanged were 44-year-old Amos Armit and Elijah Kellum. The latter was described as having a physical deformity and had been rejected twice for service in the Confederate Army. None of the 22 men who were hanged had lived past their 90 days of enlistment or received the $300 bounty promised by Union recruiters. The remaining 31 prisoners were scattered among Confederate prison camps. Most died within a few months from disease or malnutrition. Only three are known to have survived and received a parole. Pickett would face investigations and a board of inquiry after the Civil War. He fled to Canada, returning to Virginia after his former West Point classmate, General Ulysses S. Grant, intervened on his behalf. Pickett would be snubbed after the war by other former Confederate officers, including Robert E. Lee. The anecdote that best captures for me the ignominy that Pickett suffered throughout a long career of failure after Gettysburg, after Kinston, after Sailor's Creek, is that when he dies in uh, Norfolk about 10 years after the war of liver failure from, from hard drinking, it's two days before the Richmond Dispatch will print any news of his death. And the reason is they're occupied celebrating the new statue to Stonewall Jackson on Monument Avenue.